One, two, one, two, eins, zwei, yes. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll handle that. Well. So really, the title is a lie because trying to say all about all the widgets uh, wouldn't fit in 45 minutes. So I started with key widget, and then I had enough material, so I stopped there. So it's all about widget, really. Uh, but on the other hand, you'll get some new material related to Qt 4.1. So some of the things that Matthias hinted at this morning uh, will be part of this presentation. OK? So, uh, but I'm going to go through the more or less the entire Qt widget API today, uh, based on the philosophy that this is the Qt upfront track. So there'll be some very boring beginner's details, and then there'll be some things that are more in depth, uh, some things that seasoned developers don't even know necessarily about Qt widget, and then some new material in Qt 4.1. So uh, let's start. Uh, first, Qt widget's API is probably the most complex one in all of Qt, even though it's the most fundamental uh, API. So we have something like 254 functions uh, and 53 properties. And uh, so many of these features are poorly understood, or we get several bug reports related to backgrounds and, and things like that. Oh, I'm setting this color on this button, and nothing happens, or things like that. So I hope that after the talk today, you have a better understanding of how QWidget really works. Um, and then especially new features. So the two new main features in QWidget in 4.1 is the backing store uh, that Matthias talked about a bit this morning. Uh, and the fact that you, we now have something called application modality. Uh, so we have three types of modality in QDialog and actually even in QWidget, where you can say that something is non-modal or modeless, or that it's window modal, or that it's application modal, where it blocks the entire application. Okay? So uh, let's start with our uh, tour of the API. So first, um, QWidget. In Qt is also the class that is used for windows, for top-level widgets, as they used to be called in Qt3. Um, so instead of having two separate classes, one that's called QWindow and one that's called QWidget, we put everything in QWidget, and we have a series of functions that make only sense for windows, for top-level widgets. So in Qt4, we've tried to be more systematic in our naming convention. So we give a name that actually contains the word window, in the function name, so uh, set window title, set window icon, and so on, instead of set caption or set icon. Uh, so people would call set icon on a Q push button and wonder why nothing happened. Uh, so this is not going to happen anymore. Um, then we have some new properties in Qt4. We have the, uh, the window modified property, which you can set if, you, if your window represents some kind of document that has been edited, so there's some modification to it. Uh, so on Macintosh, it will change the look of the close button to have a little dot in it, which is the uh, Mac way of saying that the file was modified. On other platforms, we uh, use an asterisk in the window title. So usually, the asterisk is right after the file name. And uh, so for that to work, you have to basically use a certain placeholder in this case, it's a bracket, star bracket, to indicate where the asterisk should go when the file has been modified. So you have a little code snippet here that shows how it works. Uh, so don't worry, the uh, examples that come with Q, the application example, uh, and the SDI example, MDI example, use these features in Qt4 to indicate that the file is modified uh, instead of using a little uh, mod uh, thing in the uh, status bar. And finally, there's is window and window. So is window returns true if the widget is top level, uh, if it doesn't have a visual parent on screen, um, and window returns that parent in the case where it's not a window. So in case where it's a window, window returns itself, this. Next step, window flags. This is also something that only makes sense for uh, top-level widgets for Windows. Um, so window flags, they're fundamental things that affect the way uh, Windows behave or look. Um, and we've always carried them as a third parameter to the QWidget constructor and several other constructors 
in previous versions of Qt. And we still have them, but we need them much less often now because we factored out certain other attributes uh, out of there and we only kept things that really must be set at construction time. So uh, the look of the border of a top level widget or window um, has to be set before you show the window the first time. It's necessary for the window system to know it. Therefore, we put it in the constructor. In spite of this, we have a setter that will effectively recreate the widget if necessary, so that you can set the flags at any time using set window flags. The flags themselves are split in kind of two fields, you could say. Uh, first, you have the window type, uh, which is one of the following. You have a full list there, so you have widget, window, dialog, etc. Um, and you have zero or more hints that you can add if you want the window to have a certain behavior on a certain platform. Uh, so first, the types. So the default type is widget. And the widget type, what it means is uh, the usual thing when you create a Q widget, that if it has a parent, it's a child widget. And if it has no parent, it's a window. So this is what widget means. It's the default, uh, actually this enum value is zero. So if you don't specify it, what you really have is a widget. But then you also have window. So you can create a window with a parent if you want, as long as you use window as the window type. Um, there's no much point in doing that, except that then you get the auto-deletion. When you delete the parent object or the parent widget, then that window will also be deleted. Uh, so that's how you can decouple the parenting and the visual impression that you get. Dialog is more or less the same as window, which is why you can create a dialog with a parent, and in spite of that, the dialog will be top level. Uh, except that dialog has some extra features related to the default buttons and stuff like that. So it's a special type. Um, then we have sheet and drawer, which are special types of dialogs on Mac. And on other platforms, we simply support them as if they were plain dialogues. And then there's pop-up, tool, tooltip, slash screen, desktop, and sub-window, uh, which are fairly obvious except for sub-window, which I believe simply means child widget. So you can create a child widget with no parents, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> then we have a series of hints, uh, which are a bit more interesting, maybe. So we have a whole series of them. We can say uh, the window stay on top hint. Uh, ask the window system to try to keep the, uh, the, the uh, window on top of all their windows from the same application. Um, but all of those are just hints. There was a word hint in the name to highlight the fact that you cannot rely on them working on all window systems or on all platforms. So, um, and there are some of them that have a platform name in their names, like MS Window, Own DC, uh, X11 Bypass Window Manager, Hint, etc. So these symbols exist on all platforms, but they will do nothing on the other platforms for which they were not meant. So that, those were the window flags. So in addition to that, we have the widget attribute, which are a whole series of attributes, a whole series of enums that you can set on any widget, child widget or top level widget, and uh, that you can set at any time. And those used to be part of the uh, W flags in Qt3, but in Qt4, we split them up. So the most important ones are the delete on close, which used to be called the destructive close in Qt3. Uh, we have the Mac metal style. So if you set that one, it means that the widget and its child widgets will have a metal look, uh, which is an alternative look that is available on Mac. So on other platforms, it does nothing. Then there's the hover attribute, which usually is used by uh, style writers, so people who write custom styles. Uh, it's useful if you want a special effect when the cursor moves over your widget. So if you want your push button to change color or to raise or something, when you move your cursor over it, what the style would then do is set this attribute on all push buttons for the application, and then that would generate a paint event whenever the cursor enters, and whenever the cursor leaves, giving an opportunity to the application, uh, to the style, to uh, paint the widget differently at that moment. So this is new with Qt4. 
Previously, the way to implement that was to install an event filter and catch the uh, enter and leave event. Finally, there's the contents propagated uh, attribute in Qt 4.0, which is about uh, which is to make widgets transparent. So you can have a uh, widget that doesn't draw its background but inherits it from the widget underneath it or the window underneath it. So this feature used to be something you could turn on in Qt 4.0. In Qt 4.1, and I think it only works on certain platforms, I'm not sure. In 4.1, it's the default behavior and it works on all platforms. So this actually is obsolete already uh, six months after being introduced. Lots of cool stuff happening at Trotic all the time. Okay, here we have a whole series of borrowing functions that deal with the geometry of widgets. So the uh, uh, first there's a distinction between geometry and frame geometry. So for widgets, child widgets, it doesn't matter, but for top level widgets, uh, windows again, uh, the difference is the frame geometry includes a window frame. So when you say to a widget or to window, put yourself at coordinate 10, 10 on the screen, uh, usually what you want is the top left corner of the frame to be at 10, 10. So this is what uh, move and x, x and y actually are all about. So the setter functions don't influence geometry, they actually are related to frame geometry all the little convenience functions written there. So this is uh, an issue you have to, take to be aware of when you save and restore the position of windows on the screen, uh, because you don't want to save the geometry and restore it using move, uh, because that, those are not the same coordinates. There's one that uses a frame, the other one doesn't. So you have to make sure to use frame geometry in conjunction with move, for example. Then there's children rec, which is a rectangle that encapsulates all the children, so uh, that might be useful for some people, I don't know who. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Set contents margin is much more interesting. It's a new feature in Qt 4. Previously, when you set a layout on a widget, the layout would cover the entire widget, and the layout itself would have its own margin, but that would be it. So when you had the widget like a Q frame or Q group box, you always had the problem of putting the layout at the right place. So how did we solve that in Qt? Uh, for QFrame, we actually never really solved it. And for QGroupBox, where we needed some extra place for a label, extra room at the top, what we did is that we had our own layout in, Q, uh, in QFrame, our own mechanism in there. Uh, sorry, not in QFrame, in QGroupBox. And you had to use that. But designer used its own hack where it created a child layout of that layout and so on instead of using that layout and, and it was a big mess. So we decided to solve the problem in a more generic way where it belongs in queue object, uh, I mean queue widget. So uh, we added the function set contents margin. The default is zero, 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 zero. And when we implement a widget like queue group box, we just put 20 at the top, 10 at the bottom, 10 at the left, and 10 on the right side, for example. And so you can use it for your own widgets, and then you are in designer, put the layout on it, and layout covers exactly the area that it should cover. New in Qt 4. Then there's some stuff you probably heard about, the minimum size, maximum size, fixed size, which is simply the same thing as calling minimum and maximum one after the other. There's a set size increment, which is for people who don't like their windows to grow by one pixel at once. So if you want it to grow by 16, like boop, 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 then you use set size increment. And if you want them to be grow by 16, but not necessarily be a multiple of 16, you want to start at 100 and then go by 16, then you set the base size to be 100, 100, or something like that. So there is lots of room for imagination there. Uh, and finally, there are functions to map coordinates to and from the parent or the child. Because coordinates in Qt are usually uh, related to the current widget. So if you uh, draw a pixel at 0, 0, then you draw it at 0, 0 on your child, not on the entire window or not on the entire desktop. So sometimes you need to convert coordinates. This is fairly rare in general because Qt already, when Qt gives you events, it already does all the conversion that's necessary. So when you have event propagation, you don't accept this mouse event and it's sent to somebody else and so on. 
the uh, coordinates are converted each time, so you don't need to worry about it. And the events also have, there's pass function and there's a global pass function that gives you the screen coordinate in case you want to pop up a uh, pop-up menu. Okay, event handling is fairly straightforward. There's the event function that receives all the events for QObject or QWidget. And it sends the events, depending on the type, forward to different uh, event handlers. So the advantage is that you don't have to cast the event type yourself. Qt has those ugly casts inside of, it, uh, inside of its uh, code. And you just re-implement the correct function with the correct signature, and you handle the event there. And those events can be created by the system. They can be created by Qt, or they can be even created by you, by the application. Uh, which is very rare, but you can do it. And uh, an example is the, uh, usually there's a high level API for creating events. For example, if you want to create a paint event to repaint an area of your widget, you would just use the update function that does it for you instead of trying to do it yourself, which would have done the, given the same result, but have taken more code. So uh, one little uh, thing about event handling I wanted to mention is the fact that mouse move event is only called when the mouse button is held. So this is a, fr a frequent error that people do is they try to implement the mouse event and they don't get the events and wonder why. It's simply because by default, Qt optimizes away mouse events, which usually don't mean anything. If you just move the mouse on your application, usually nothing should happen. But there is a function there. And since I'm, since I'm trying to cover the entire API today, I had to mention set mouse tracking true. So we're, get, we're getting there. We're about at 50 functions mentioned so far. There are 200 and, 204 left. So to stay in the uh, event area, we have the grabbing, which uh, I personally never had to do, but maybe some people need to do it sometimes. Grabbing means that you want to receive events even when a priori the events will not be sent to you. Um, so mouse events that are, when the mouse is located on other widgets than you, um, a priori are not sent to you, they're sent to the widget that's under the, the mouse. So uh, what sometimes you might want just to grab the mouse and get all the events for a certain period of time, but then you have to release, to remember to call release mouse as soon as possible so that the rest of the desktop becomes uh, responsive, responsive again. But Qt already calls grab mouse in one case. It's a case where you hold the mouse button down. So if you click on a widget and start moving around, then Qt already grabs the mouse for you. So this is why you can click on a push button, and then you can move the cursor all around your desktop, and no bad things happen. It's because Qt does it, which is a nice default behavior. It also means that when you receive events, you can receive events that have coordinates outside of the widget uh, range. You can get a, a mouse uh, release event at minus 10, minus 10. Uh, entirely possible because of that. There's also a grab keyboard and release keyboard. I have no clue, honestly, who needs it. But is there anybody who ever used these? Raise your hand. Oh, OK. Talk to me afterwards. Tell me what you use it for. I'll write an article in QQuarly about it. Escape? Escape? Yeah, the known problem with QT. Uh. How to cook, how to uh, call the key state, escape key state. Ah, escape. So I'll write those a, you use get async event for, for the native Windows application. Like how to use that. Okay, cool. I'll talk to you afterwards. I'll, and then either you write or I write an article in Qt Corley about that. Qt Corley 17. Okay, now we'll talk about, <coughs> wait a second, I'm a Frenchman almost, so I'll be careful with that word. The focus handling. Uh, so uh, the, uh, there are several functions that deal with the focus, and um, some of these are sometimes poorly understood. Basically, all widgets by default have a focus policy that say how they should behave relative to focus, whether they accept it or not. For example, a queue label, you, you might click as much as you want on a queue label, but nothing will ever happen. It's not going to accept focus because what is focus? Focus is about the keyboard, is getting the keyboard input. 
So uh, a label, there's nothing to type in there. It's not an input widget, so there's no point in giving the focus to a label. So Qt's widgets, Qt's built-in widgets, already have proper defaults, so you don't usually don't need to set it, but sometimes you might want to do it. So then you can play around with, the, with different policies. Uh, so whether it should be part of the tab chain or not, whether you should be able to click or not on it to give it focus. And uh, strong focus is both at the same time. And then there's wheel fo focus, <laughs> wheel focus, which is like strong focus, but it also accepts focus when you use the, um, the uh, wheel, the mouse wheel on top of the widget. And uh, then uh, you can give at any time programmatically the focus to a widget by calling set focus. And you have to pass a reason, whether it's a tab or whether it's a click or whether it's something else. And you can at any time remove the focus to a widget you want to take nice screenshots of your application, for example, then you'd use clear focus. Um, that's what I would do. And then there's half focus to check if one widget has it or not. There's also the mechanisms called focus proxies where you say, oh, when is this widget's turn to get the focus? It should just pass it on to some other widget instead. So you just pass the other widget, you call it the near constructor, for example, and then uh, all the time afterwards, that, that will work. Um, then you have, uh, you can access at any time the widget that has a focus uh, for a certain window by calling focus widget. And you can check who's going to be the next one if somebody presses tab. Uh, you can actually simulate a tab by calling focus next child or uh, shift tab by calling focus previous child. So these functions are new in Qt 4.1, I think. It used to be called focus, next, prev, child, true, or false. So we actually renamed those finally. And um, when a widget gets a focus, you get events. And by default, you also get a paint event. If the, uh, yeah, no, you just get a paint event, so you don't need to worry about that. But sometimes you might want to do something special for some reason. Finally, there's a set tab order function that allows you to specify in which order you want the widget to get a focus. But normally, you don't need to call it because the, the tab chain, the chain order will be the same one in which you created your widgets. So if you create them in the logical order from top to bottom, then you'll have a uh, coherent tab sequence uh, without having to call that function. And if you want a different tab order, you might just reorder your creation of widgets instead of calling this function. So I personally never call this function in my code. Okay, I'll drink some water, then we'll see the palette. So uh, the palette is one of those things, like everything else, that has changed in Q4. It, uh, in Q3, a palette consisted of three color groups, uh, active, inactive, and disabled. This is still the case in Q4 except that we don't have a class called QColorGroup anymore. It's all been eaten up by QPalette uh, because we discovered that the different color groups were too dependent on each other that they did not provide a meaningful abstraction. And also because you always needed to get the palette, then the color group, then the color, and so on. So it was several steps. So what we do instead is that the QPalette object has the concept of what's the current color group and then it operates on that. So when you ask a widget, oh, give me the palette, it will already be set with the correct uh, group in the QPalette uh, variable, and then you can directly ask for a color, and it will give it active or inactive based on that. So you don't need to think about it. But you can explicitly require a certain group if you want using uh, the enums that are listed there. And then each group, contains several roles. So there's a foreground role, which in Qt 4.1 is renamed the uh, window text mode. Uh, I did not know when I did this presentation, discovered last week. Actually, it was done last week. Uh, there's button, there's light, mid light, background, which is renamed window in Qt 4.1, uh, and so on. And each role is really a cube brush. So it's not necessarily just a color, it can be can be a color as, and a texture, so little lines on, on the Mac, or it can be a, 
I mean, uh, no, that's a brush pattern, but it can be a real texture, so it's a pix map that's repeated, uh, or it can even be a gradient. But in old-fashioned application, it was just a color, so a solid pattern associated with a gray color, typically, some shade of gray. And uh, finally, some styles right now adjust the palette on individual widgets. So even if you don't set the palette yourself on any widget, uh, I think the combo boxes on Windows XP style might actually have a palette that is set by the style and unset when you switch the style dynamically. So that's something to be aware of. Then there's the background and foreground roles, which should be renamed the window and window text roles. Uh, actually, no. They're fine like they are, I'm sorry. Uh, one reason for the renaming is that there was some confusion before, and still today apparently, um, about this property we have in QWidget. It's called the background role. This property specifies which color is used by the window system to redraw the background and which color is used by Qt uh, to initialize the background if it's not the Windows system's job to do it uh, before the paint event so that you can rely on all pixels being initialized to some color. And by default, we use the background role from the palette, so some kind of shade of gray usually, to uh, initialize the background so it looks like gray and boring. And, uh, but you can change that. If you want the background to be uh, very light, like a Q-line edit, then you'd, uh, then you'd set it to uh, base. Or if you want it to be really dark, because you have some strange plot or widget or something, then you'd set it to dark. So you set the background role of the widget to dark or to base instead of setting it to background. So because there's this background role property in QWidget, and the background role in QPalette, which are not necessarily the same thing, we just decided to rename that background thing in palette, we call it window, because that's how you normally paint a window. And you don't paint ch ch uh, child which has backgrounds anymore, so it's only windows that have a color, really, that have a, a palette in Q41. Then there's a foreground role, which is the um, complementing color that should be used for the uh, for drawing on top of that background. So normally you'd think you'd have to set both, because if you set uh, your background to dark, you don't want to be drawing using black. You don't want to draw any text in black, it would be totally unreadable. But Qt already has some built-in logic, which means that you normally don't have to set the foreground role. It already deduces, depending on the role that you set for the background, which is the appropriate role for the foreground. You can, get, you can just set the background role and then use foreground role getter in your drawing code to draw some kind of foreground. Okay? By the way, if there's anything that's unclear as I go, uh, you can ask questions directly. I guess that's fine. It's a small room and that, that should work. Uh, because I'm covering several different topics and at the end it might be confusing to go back to some slide. Uh, but if you have general questions right at the end, and if you want to talk about Quebec politics, see me at 6 uh, in front of the hotel. So uh, back to window modality. Uh, modality is this thing, again, that changed in, in, uh, in 4.1. So previously what we had, we had a getter for modality in QWidget, but a setter in QDialog, because the mechanism is actually implemented somewhere in QWidget, interestingly enough. But the, uh, we don't want people to do it in QWidget. We prefer them to do it in QDialog. But still, the ultimate flag that controls that is an attribute called show model, which means that when the widget is shown um, on screen, it should block all the others. So by show model, we, we're talking about the show function. We're talking about exec function in QDialog or anything. When this window is shown, it should block all of the, uh, the rest of the uh, I mean, the parent widget windows and all the children of the parent window, and so on and so on. So uh, in Qt 4.0 and in previous version of Qt, the exec function actually sets the show model flag before it uh, actually shows the widget and before it does the event loop. And then after all of that, it unsets it 
if it wasn't already set. So this is why it's possible in Qt3 to just, uh, or even in Qt4.0, to just uh, create a dialog and call exec. And then the, the dialog will be shown modal, even if you don't set it explicitly to be modal. And the default is modeless, non-modal. Finally, there's a special flag that's called group leader, which you can live a long and happy life without until the day where you need it. And you have no idea that this is a flag that's going to help you. Um, so if you have a, uh, <laughs> it has a strange name as well, group leader. So if you have, for example, a dialogue that is modal, but you want to create a, a help browser that is independent from that dialogue, so you don't want the help browser to block anything else. Uh, well, in Qt3, it was impossible, or even in 4.0, without setting this flag on the, uh, the help browser. And, and then it would work. Then you could close a dialog, and the help browser would stay up and running, and it would be independent. It would not be blocked by any modal dialog, and so on and so on, uh, which is necessary when, when you have modal dialog up and you want the help related to that dialog. So in Qt4.1, we kind of got rid of that. And what we added instead is the set window modality function that you can set on any window. The default is non-modal, non but you can say window modal or application modal. And uh, that's enough to remove all that, uh, to remove the group leader, for example. Because what you do then is you'd create your child widget and then you'd set its modality to uh, non-modal, I believe, because of the, uh, if I remember correctly. And um, I'm not sure actually how it works. But anyway, there's a trick, and then you don't need that flag. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's documented if you go to a WA group leader, so this is obsolete, do that instead. Uh, maybe I should read the documentation. And if it's not there, then I should write it. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, the, the group leader also exists in Qt3. It's uh, actually I use it in the Qt book for uh, in providing online help, chapter 18. Uh, I was blocked. I was like, how can I make that work? And then I went to a Qt guru. He said, oh, you need a group leader. So um, it's magic. Actually, yeah, I'm supposed to write a Qt quarterly article about that. Yeah, good idea. Double buffering, this is a cool topic because it's uh, always getting better and better. So uh, first, double buffering is a solution to several problems, uh, just like money, for example. But uh, one problem that is often solved uh, through double buffering is flicker. And in Q3, what you do is you just create a, a pix map. Instead of just having a straight paint event that paints on on a widget, you'd create a pix map, you'd paint into that pix map, you'd copy that pix map onto a screen. So in Qt4, this is done automatically as an anti-flicker measure. So you don't need to worry about flicker, uh, at least not as much because it's taken care of. But you might still need double buffering for other reasons. For example, because you're drawing some rubber band and you need to erase the rubber band and so on and so on. So double buffering is still a useful technique in Qt4, and will still be covered by next version of the book, of course. So, um, but to go back to uh, Flickr, um, in, in Qt4, the fact that we use, we implement our own double buffering natively uh, all the time, means uh, one consequence of that is that we don't support paint events, uh, we don't support drawing outside of paint events anymore. And uh, so this means that you have to structure your code in a somewhat different way if you use the great two painters all over the place, uh, not necessarily as a response to uh, paint event. So you could just remove that code and call update instead, but it might make your application a bit slower if you repaint too much, or if your logic in paint event uh, is not that sophisticated or optimized to redraw only the areas that need to be redrawn. So it can make your code a bit more complicated. However, uh, there are two flags that you can use in that context. There's the paint outside paint event, uh, which is not supported on Mac because the underlying technology we use on Mac simply doesn't let us uh, paint outside of paint event. Um, and uh, there's the paint on screen, which says uh, bypass the double buffer. So if you know what you're doing, so that might be an optimization. 
Okay. Then there, I'll just check how much time I have. Very little, so I'll skip the updates. It's just like in San Jose. Um, polishing. Um, Polishing, uh, actually, I'm not sure I pronounce this word correctly. I apologize to all the people from Poland. Uh, <laughs> pol polishing um, is, um, is uh, in Qt is the fact that sometimes you, you want to do something in this constructor, but you cannot do it because it relies on some um, virtual function being called, and virtual functions, the v tables are not initialized until the subclasses constructors are called. So you have to wait to just after the constructor to do it. So we have a general mechanism in Qt where every widget gets a uh, Polish event uh, before, uh, before it's shown the first time. <laughs> I apologize again. Uh, apologies. And um, so that event is, is sent, and you can handle it you, by re-implementing the event function um, and do something that you could not do in constructor before it's shown. What you can also do in a style is re-implement the uh, function of the same name. And um, it gets, so any widget that is shown with a style can re-implement it and set some properties on the widget, set the palette. Uh, and there's also an unpolished version that allows you to undo what you did uh, in the first function. <laughs> Transparency. Uh, is something that is constantly evolving in queue. So first we had, uh, actually this is not chronological, first we had the, uh, the mask business. The mask business is a um, transparency mask is for uh, non-rectangular uh, widgets. So you can specify that certain areas of a widget should are not part of the widget. So if it's a window, if it's a top level window, then you see the desktop true. So we used to have the good old Tux example that showed it, a little penguin with uh, no background. And uh, so we still support that in Qt4. Um, and then what is not painted actually belongs yet to the desktop or to the children that are underneath and so on. But in Qt4.1, we don't necessarily need it because we can just uh, rely on the fact that the background of a child widget is not painted by default. So we just need to stack widgets, and that's fine, and it works. So we stack widgets top of each other without uh, drawing all the pixels on the top widget, then we'll see the other widgets behind underneath. And what is really cool is that the top widget can use Q colors that have an alpha channel that is different from 255. So you can have semi-transparency where it will be combined with the widget underneath and the widget underneath that one again. So you can have really neat effects and uh, you can have uh, widgets with round corners where the round corner will actually blend into the background, which is not necessarily gray. Uh, I have a question here. Yes, uh, my question is that can you use uh, alpha channel for uh, masks? For the uh, set mask, no. The uh, set mask is one or zero, it's uh, all or nothing. But you don't need that mechanism anymore, except you could. The only issue is top-level wid widget uh, windows. You cannot even in 4.1 have a widget that has a, uh, a, a complicated alpha mask. You can have a certain uh, transparency. Say, that, oh, I want the entire window to be semi-transparent related to the desktop. And this is done by set window opacity there. But you cannot say, oh, I want parts of it to be 3 fourths transparent and other parts of it to be 1 fourth. This is simply not supported by window systems. And even the window opacity here is not supported by a standard uh, X11. So uh, we're kind of bound to the uh, underlying window system there. But it's going to happen, I think, uh, in Qt Embedded or Qtopia Core as being rebranded. And I think we'll have that feature there because it's very easy for, to implement for us. OK? It's OK. The backing store is a feature that Matthias presented this morning. Uh, I have a couple of slides. Basically, a backing store is a per persistent double buffer uh, on a complete window, as opposed to having uh, one single small queue, uh, queue uh, pixmap 
that is used whenever you want to paint individual widgets. So if you have 10 windows of your application, you'll have 10 pix maps that will live along these windows. And whenever the window is hidden and shown, if the window system doesn't remember the, uh, the drawing, uh, Qt will just provide it, just blit it instead of generating paint events to your application. So it means that exposes are very quick, among other things. And that persistent double buffer makes the sub-widget composition possible. The fact that we have semi-transparent -trans semi widgets uh, and so on are all consequences of, uh, of this mechanism that we've implemented now uh, on all supported platforms. So on Mac, it already existed. Uh, on some versions of uh, X, uh, we use or we will use, I'm not sure, uh, the existing uh, composite manager and on other platforms, we'll just implement our own. <laughs> so the advantages, uh, actually the, the first two I've already mentioned, the third one is I'm told that it results in faster drawing on Microsoft Windows. Uh, if you want to know why, you should talk to Gunnar, which is uh, having presentations today somewhere. Yeah, I think he had this previous slot. OK. Yeah, have some seconds. Uh, yes? Okay, the question is whether child widgets share the backing store of their parents. And the answer is yes, one window is one backing store or is one uh, buffer, and the widgets just draw themselves directly into that window. And uh, so yes, it's, it's not, there's no buffer associated to each widget, it's only to each window. So this is one difference between Q4.0 and 4.1. Okay, I'll just check how many slides I have left. <laughs> Woo! Okay, five. I'm <laughs> sorry. I should have a little count in the corner. It would be cool. Uh, I'll skip styles. Layouts. Anybody wants to hear about layouts, or should I skip? Yeah. You want to hear about layouts? Yeah. Okay, so I have this very... The improvements of these, because you have several of these size policies, and I have never figured out what does prefer. Okay, well... <laughs> Prefer means may grow and or shrink. <laughs> okay, the difference between preferred and expanding is that if you just have preferred in your dialog or if you have just expanding in your dialog, you have, if you don't combine the two, they'll kind of look the same. They are different the day you actually combine them together because expanding wants to expand infinitely more than preferred. So if you have a Q push button that has its preferred size at 80 and you have Q push button next to it that has its, pre its expanding size hint at 80, um, then the preferred one will stop at 80 and the expanding will eat all the place uh, that remains. So the expanding says, hey, if you have place, give it to me, please. Uh, whereas preferred just says, yeah, I can handle it if I have to. Uh, so it makes a difference only. <laughs> oh, it's not clear? Oh, it's clear. Did I say something funny? <laughs> I tried to make jokes in previous presentation, nobody laughed, now I'm not even trying. <laughs> okay, a uh, little time. So basically, uh, my suggestion is uh, get the cute book because we've got this great diagram in it that shows, actually it doesn't show difference between those two. You have to read the little paragraph just below the diagram. put all these widgets in a, in, in a layout, yeah. you will never expect the right behavior. Uh, maybe with the labels, I agree, yeah. But you can change it. So anyway, the key is to remember that maximum is smaller than minimum. The day you understand that, you're on the right path. <laughs> It's true, it took me like two years before I got that much. So uh, maybe we should rename the, uh, the enum values. So, uh, okay, then there's a thing called height for width. I'll just tell you it exists. Uh, Qt Coralie number three, I believe, has an article about it. It's on the web, so, uh, and I have little time. Um, 
right to left layout. Um, you can set the layout direction on the entire queue application or on individual child widgets uh, to say that you want the layout to go from right, right to left instead of left to right. So this is useful in cultures where the direction of writing is right to left because then you actually want everything to be kind of flipped. But it's not something that we can do at the lower level drawing pixels because if you load an image and you're based, I don't know, in Israel or you're based in Egypt, you don't want the picture to be swapped because of that. So Qt, Qt cannot really do it all the way for you. So we do it at the, um, at the layout system level and at the widget level. So if you have custom widgets uh, in styles, we have special code that handle uh, the right to left thing, it just checks always oh, this widget left to right or right to left. And so when the layout direction is right to left, the interesting thing is that the word left and all the rest of Q suddenly becomes right and vice versa. And this is normally what you want. This is a cool thing. Uh, there's those people who think that left should always mean left, and there are other people who think that left should actually swap. But the advantage of changing the behavior uh, of all of Qt is that applications written by, uh, I don't know, are there any Americans here? Americans uh, would work fine if they just write left and then they port it uh, and they translate it later and the application would keep working fine because everything would adapt smoothly. So in the rare cases when you really mean left, you can pipe it with a line absolute and then you really get left. And uh, okay. Now, if you are, I don't know, developing software in Israel or in Egypt or Morocco, and you're a bit perturbed by the fact that left is right and right is left, um, then you can use align leading and align trailing, which are synonyms for align left and right. Uh, it's more abstract vocabulary, but uh, it's what Java uses, so it's good. <laughs> then we have the context menus. I don't know how much time do I have left. I have minus one, yeah. <laughs> I have 10 minutes, cool. Okay, um, we have a new mechanism for context menus in Q4 according to the philosophy that nothing should be left unchanged. So we, um, what we have is uh, in Q3, if you wanted to add a custom uh, a context menu to a, a widget, you had to implement this virtual function called context, um, context menu event, I think. And sometimes you wanted to do something really silly, like you just wanted a little little menu with cut, copy, and paste. And you had to re-implement a virtual function to do that. Uh, you, you'd wish you had the setter or something like that. And sometimes you wanted to add the menu on behalf of some other widget, or um, you want to extend the menu provided by Qtext Edit, or there were like lots of problems previously, like lots of things, and the answer was always, well, subclass it, re-implement, the event and provide your own menu. So we, we try to provide more flexibility in Qt4. So what we have is a property that's called the context menu policy in QWidget. And you have four policies. You have the no context menu. You, you have the default context menu, which is a default, which means that it will uh, call the event handler, the context menu event handler. Uh, you have the actions context menu which means that it will use the actions that were set on the widget. We have this mechanism in Q4 and QWidget uh, where we have the add action function where you can just add some actions to your widget. If this widget is a toolbar, then the actions will be shown in a toolbar as toolbar buttons. If the, uh, if the widget is a menu, then those will be menu items. If the widget is anything else, nothing will happen unless you implement the, uh, the event handler. So by setting this property on a Q push button, for example, uh, or Qtext edit, then you can set actions which do nothing, but then when the user right clicks, gets a, he or she gets a context menu with those actions in the order that they were inserted. So this is very convenient if all you want is add a set of fixed actions uh, or fairly fixed actions to uh, not non-context dependent to the context menu of a certain widget. And finally, there is the custom context menu policy, in which case we just emit a signal and hope that somebody connected to it. So it's a kind of guarantee when, when you set this pr property to custom context menu, 
we take for granted that somebody will have connected to that signal and will handle it, and we will not propagate the event. So that's why this could not be combined with the default behavior. We could not just simply emit the signal all the time, because we would not know if somebody did something about it or not. Then there's a series of help texts. Uh, that's very boring, but the cool thing in Q4 is that they're all properties of QWidget, and they're all uniformly set using plain old setters instead of Q tool tip colon colon add or things like that. So it's all centralized now, uh, helping us uh, reaching the magic number of 256 functions in QWidget. So in conclusion, um, I have six minutes for this slide. That will be boring. <laughs> so in conclusion, the um, QWidget API is full of surprises, even to Troll Tech developers and even Today I had a couple of things that I wasn't so sure about, so it uh, just proves it. Um, the cool thing is with Qt4, we've uh, taken the opportunity to uh, clean up the API. We've changed some things that had not changed in 10 years before, 11 years. So uh, hoping that we would not have to change them, at least for six months, as we saw. Um, and so today we, uh, today we have a stronger, um, we have a stronger basis on which we can build for, for some time ahead. Um, and then we have uh, several new cool features like the automatic double buffering, uh, composition manager. We have the widgets that can now be larger than 32,000 per 32,000, uh, which simplifies our uh, things a, uh, a lot. For example, we could get rid of the Q scroll view class, uh, which was trying to fake a huge canvas on top of a small widget. Uh, and instead, we simply have a widget with two scroll bars. So replace like 5,000 lines of code with 300 just by eliminating this constraint in QWidget, actually working around the constraint of the window system. So that's basically it. So if you have any questions, uh, I guess you can just uh, uh, come to me afterwards or something, right? Because it's getting late. Okay, thank you.